Picture this scene for me, if you will. It's a miserable, freezing cold, gray, somber day in the very worst part of downtown Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and leaning up against a pawn shop window to protect himself against the driving rain was a bum, a 35-year-old bum. No coat to protect him, shirt hanging out, hair down to his shoulders, bloodshot eyes, and he was afraid, and he was alone, and he was about as low as anybody can get. And all of a sudden, something inside the pawn shop on a shelf caught his eye. It was a little handgun, and attached to the handgun was a yellow tag, 29 bucks. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out three soggy $10 bills. That's all he had in the world. And he thought, hey, there's the answer to all my problems. I'll buy that gun. I'll get a couple of bullets. I'll take them back to that mangy room where I'm staying. I'll put the bullets in the gun. I'll put the gun to my head. And I'll pull the trigger. And then never again will I ever have to face that miserable failure in the mirror. That man had indeed been a failure. He had managed in just a few short years to lose everything in life that was important to him. A lovely wife, a beautiful daughter, a nice home, a promising job, and all his faith, and all his hope, and all his self-esteem. He had tried to play the game of life like so many of us do, without taking the time to learn the rules. And now he was paying the price for his ignorance on that miserable, gray, cold morning in Cleveland, Ohio. He was just about ready to throw his life away. That scenario, I'm sorry to say, is repeated hundreds of times every day in this lovely country of ours, when people finally lose all hope in a future that once was so bright and so full of hope. And you know, that doesn't count the thousands who don't take their life, but they just give up. They quit. They stop trying. And they lead what Henry David Thoreau once called lives of quiet desperation. They're dead at 30 or 35 or 40, even though we won't get around to burying them until they're 72. Fortunately, that miserable wretch, that loser, that bum, standing in the cold rain, didn't buy that gun. He didn't blow his life away in that terrible morning almost 35 years ago. Because if he had, I wouldn't be here with you tonight. I guess it's natural and I expect it that whenever I'm being interviewed on radio or television or by the press, I'm always being asked, how did you manage to turn your life around so dramatically? And what did you do that raised you from the gutter to the presidency of Success Unlimited magazine in less than 10 years? And where did you, such a loser with the, only a high school education, get all the wisdom and the knowledge to write all those best-selling books? And what secrets of success? You see, they insist on calling them secrets. Did you learn that you could share with others who are looking for some answers on how to turn their life around? Well, I usually reply that everything I learned is in my books. But I won't do that to you. I didn't come 1,200 miles to tease you or to play games with you tonight. You see, I know from past experience, I know from past experience, that in every audience, even this one, whether they be famous top executives, salespeople, 
athletes, students, small business owners, but in every audience, there is always someone out there who feels the walls closing in and who may be smiling on the outside right now, tonight, and yet they're dying on the inside. And they might be even just about ready to give up on life as I was long ago. And that person is out there somewhere silently hoping or silently praying that something I might say or something I might do might be just the life preserver that he or she needs to keep from drowning in a, in a sea of misery. What are we doing to ourselves? The number of heroin cocaine and crack addicts is growing so swiftly each day that we have finally admitted we can no longer keep anywhere near an accurate count. Did you know we're consuming more booze now per capita than any time in the history of the United States? How's this for a number? Last year in this wonderful gorgeous country of ours more than 300,000 people tried to commit suicide. That's a city. They're prescribing 5 million prescriptions for Valium every 30 days. And we're now treating more than 4,000 new cases of mental illness every 24 hours. Think about that one. There must be a better way to live. And there is a better way to live. And Mr. X or Ms. X, wherever you are out there, I'm going to toss out some life preservers for you. And let's see what happens. The most important secret of success that I had to learn the hard way is that life is a game. It's spiritual and it's holy, but it's a game. And you can't play in that game with any chance at all of winning unless you know the rules. Slight problem. While we were growing up, nobody ever taught us any of the rules. Not once. Not for 45 minutes did anybody ever teach us how to set goals, how to motivate ourselves and others, how to handle adversity when it hits us, how to use our time profitably, how to get rid of the bad habits that we acquire, how to accumulate wealth, how to handle stress, and so much more. And so most of us become spectators, spectators in the greatest game of all pushed aside by the lucky few who seem to know what they want and more important who seem to know how to get it. The pros, the great performers, those who know the rules, they're all down on the field where all the action, all the glory and all the money is. And the rest of us we're up in the bleachers watching them, and we had to pay to get in. <laughs> okay, let's take inventory. Did we possibly learn anything during all those years of schooling that we could apply, that we could use starting tomorrow morning if we wanted to make a real move at changing our life for the better, even better than it is? You bet we did. We all learned how to read with that one great ability that all of you have, the ability to read. You can work miracles in your life. Carlisle many years ago wrote, what we become depends on what we read after all the professors have finished with us. The greatest university of all, he wrote, is a collection of books. And I have a dear friend who is a marvelous speaker. He builds himself as Charles Tremendous Jones, and he is indeed tremendous. He is always telling his audiences, 
you will be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. Let me repeat that. You will be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. So why not resolve to maybe make a slight alteration in your daily routine? And those of you, and I know there are many out there who have people under their supervision, suggest that they do the same thing. The next night that you're free, instead of collapsing in front of that television set at home, why not take a little trip down to your local library? Walk in, find that special shelf of books that's in every library, that gold mine, that shelf containing books on success, how to achieve it, and how to hold on to it after you get it. Walk up and introduce yourself to some of the most powerful people who have ever lived. People like Napoleon Hill, Norman Vincent Peale, Maxwell Maltz, Dorothea Brand, W. Clement Stone. They're waiting. They're waiting at this very minute to help you, to guide you, and to teach you the rules of the game. Of course, there's a little problem. You have got to go to them. I did many years ago. And it didn't take long for that miserable bum standing in the rain to become not much more than just a bad memory. Thank God. Another important and ageless secret that I had to learn with pain and tears, I had to learn them all with pain and tears. Thick up here. It takes a while. Is that you can never, you can never make progress in your life until you appreciate the assets that you already possess. Now, I can always picture, whenever I say that, I know that somebody is out there thinking, I got bills up to here. My car is falling apart. We're a month behind on the rent. Kids are talking about college. And this turkey is up here talking about my assets. So let's take an inventory. Let's take an inventory right now so that you realize how valuable, how precious you really are. And let's put a dollar value, if you'd like, on some of these things you have going in your life right now, tonight, at this time. What's it worth to live in this great country? Where would you rather live? What's it worth to be associated with the fine company that you represent? What's your career worth if you remind yourself that probably 95% of the world's population would gladly give up 20 years of their life to change places with any of you? How about your freedom? Put a dollar value on that. How about those you love and who love you? How much would you take to give them up? Your eyes, would you take a million dollars for your eyes? Your hands, your feet, five million, ten million? You're really, you're really quite wealthy, aren't you? And if it came to a showdown, you wouldn't change what you have right now, tonight, for all the gold in Fort Knox. Several months ago, I did a live television show in Los Angeles, and on the panel with me was a very famous American woman author who shall remain nameless. Somehow we got off to talking about our kids. And I had just seen the last kid leave home before that, and uh, we had an empty nest, and I didn't like it. I miss my kids. And she got off on a tantrum about her two teenage sons who were still living at home and I kept hearing one word, bonkers. These kids are driving me bonkers. I'm always picking up behind them, bonkers. I'm going bonkers. Stereos tuned to different stations, very loud. Um, they're driving me bonkers, bonkers, bonkers. I, I, I listened to it for about four or five minutes and finally I, I stood up and kind of leaned over and, and, and uh, I know I was rude and I said, uh, <laughs> And, and, and I said, 
you know, the day is going to come when you're going to walk down that corridor at home and you're going to go past two very quiet rooms. And then you're going to say, where did they go? So why don't you go home tonight, I said, and give them both a big hug and tell them you love them and for God's sakes, don't wait. Another old secret. You don't know how good you are. Wise men have been telling you for centuries that you're only using about 10% of your potential. Now, you're no fool. When you hear that now, you know how to play the game. You're wise. You nod your head like you really, yeah, you buy that. You're right. Yeah, I'm only using about 10%. But we, we really don't believe them when they tell us that. Most of us are too busy instead thinking up reasons why we know we can't make it. And when somebody else does succeed, how quick we are to think, wasn't he or she lucky? It's so much easier to feel sorry for yourself, isn't it, than to realize that you are the greatest miracle in the world and your destiny is in your hands and your hands alone, no matter how you kid yourself. You are in complete control of your tomorrow. But so many of us, I'm afraid of, are like a duck that we had in our backyard back in Scottsdale, Arizona for many years. When my youngest son, Matthew, was in the eighth grade, he came home from school one day carrying a shoebox with holes punched in the cover, which should have caused us great concern right there. <laughs> in the shoebox was a little yellow duckling. They had had this little guy in their biology class, and they nurtured him for five weeks, and then they had a raffle, and my kid won the duck. <laughs> so Matt and Daddy went to the lumber company. We got some lumber, and over the corner of our backyard, we built a little hut. Matt did a great job. He painted it white. He carved out a doorway. And over the doorway, in red paint, he painted disco. Disco duck. <laughs> Daddy went to the hardware store, and I got 18-inch chicken wire, and we ran a corral around this little set up so this little guy wouldn't go wandering off and get lost. We had Disco for 12 years. <laughs> disco grew to be a big, beautiful duck, and Matt went off to college, and guess who got to take care of Disco? <laughs> we got to be good buddies. And then about two years ago, it started one morning early, just at dawn, and we made the mistake. We had built this complex right outside our bedroom. But it started right at dawn, quack, 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 loud. Now, I'd heard this quack for 10 years by then, and I knew every little resonance, every little tone. And I knew that something was bugging disco. Something was wrong. Disco, you could tell, was a whining, complaining, quack, 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 quack. Disco was not happy. Disco had a problem of some sort. Either the water, I didn't change it often enough, or the straw in his hut was wet, or the food was lousy, but something was wrong. Disco had a problem. And it's the same problem that so many of us have. Disco didn't know that if he didn't like the conditions of his life, he had it within himself to change them. He had the power to change the conditions in his life. In Disco's case, if he didn't like things the way they are, uh, the way they were, all Disco had to do was flap his wings and leave. <laughs> but you see, poor Disco, Disco didn't know that he could fly. And neither do you.